Hello, welcome to week eight of Computer Science 225. This week we're going to be talking about processes, how to start them and stop them, pause them, resume them, kill them, uh, things like that. And so first of all, we'll talk about what a process is. Now a process is the name that we give to a program while it's actually currently being run on a computer system. So if you have a program that you've written, while the program is just sort of sitting there, not running, it's just called a program. But once you actually put it into motion and have it running, then it's called a process. And the reason for this distinction is because you can have a program and you can run it multiple times all at the same time. And then you still have just one program, but you have multiple processes that are running it. So one of the main jobs of an operating system is to keep track of what processes are running at one time and sort of switch time between them so that all of them can sort of run and make progress on whatever program it is that they're working on. So today, we'll look and see how we can do lots of things with processes. First, we'll look at how you can list what processes are running on a system so you can see what is actually being executed. We'll look at how we can end a process, which is a thing that as a programmer, you'll probably have to do. For instance, if you write a program and it's taking a long time, you think maybe it has an infinite loop in it and you just need to end that process. We'll see how to do that. We'll look at how you can run a process in the background, which is to say like you can start it running and then do other things in your terminal while it's still running. Uh, that can be helpful if you have a program that takes a very long time. So for instance, to like download a super big file from the internet, you can start a process to do that, uh, but run it in the background so that you can come back to your terminal and do other things in the meantime while it's still working. We'll see how you can uh, start a process and then pause the process and then go back to it later. That's called suspending and resuming. We'll look also at how we can send signals to processes. The Unix system has this uh, system by which you can send different signals with different meanings onto processes to tell them various information. And then we'll also look at sort of an interactive tool for seeing processes and stopping them. This is uh, really helpful information for using the command line system. Oftentimes you'll have to do this with sort of the processes, the commands that we run sort of day to day, but it's especially useful as a programmer because your own processes, your own programs that you start running will sometimes just go hay haywire because we're not perfect and we make mistakes. And so you'll have programs that uh, have bugs in them and you'll need to kill them or you'll want to write programs that you can send information to and you can do that with signals and so that's uh, sort of why we're covering this information. So let's pull up a terminal and then we can start talking about how to list processes, list the processes that are running. This can be done in the most basic way with the command ps which stands for processes and so if we run this it gives us this information. So like ls-l, this process command ps gives us the sort of information that has multiple rows which are organized into columns. So we have two processes listed here. The ps command by default only gives you sort of your own processes that you've launched in this very same terminal window. So we have four columns here. The first column is pid. That stands for process identifier. So every process that's running on the operating system is given a unique ID number. That way, when we go to look at killing them and sending the different signals to these processes, we can use the ID, the PID, to refer to them. It's like the handle or the identifier we can use. The next column is usually not that helpful. It is the TTY column, which stands for teletypewriter. This also is uh, why PuTTY is called PuTTY. If you look at the PuTTY Windows SSH client, it has the word TTY capitalized in it. And the TTY, like I said, it stands for teletypewriter, which is a really antiquated piece of technology. Back in the old days of computer systems, computers were enormously expensive and not everyone could have their own. So organizations, universities, or businesses would purchase mainframe computers and to allow everyone to sort of have time on them, we would connect to them with a device called a teletypewriter. 
which is basically like a regular typewriter, except uh, it connects over the internet so that the things that are typed in go to the mainframe computer. So the teletypewriter is like your client. This is basically the same thing as what we do with the SSH system, where you're using PuTTY or another SSH client to connect to the CPSC server. So TTY refers to like what SSH connection we're on. By default, PS only shows you the, uh, the things that you were running in your same terminal window. Uh, so for now, this will just always say the same thing. Uh, when we see in a second to list all the processes, we'll see some different things on here. Now, the PTS slash zero refers to pseudo terminal because we're not physically connected to the CPSC server. If you would go to wherever the CPSC server is located and physically log on to it, you can see something else here. But for us, it'll always be a pseudo terminal, which is an SSH connection. But the number here can change. If you have like multiple SSH windows open at the same time, which is a thing that you can definitely do, uh, it's, it's helpful sometimes to do that, to have multiple connections, then you'll see some would be PTS zero and others would be PTS one or two or three. Um, but usually this column isn't like the most helpful. The next column is this time column, which shows zero for all of these things here. And that is the accumulated CPU time that these processes have taken. And if I do it again, you'll see that they're still at zero. And at first this seems really confusing maybe because we've been running these processes a little bit now and you would think it would take some time, but uh, neither bash nor PS are very time intensive at all in terms of uh, CPU execution. It's just you know taking our few commands that we've given it and running the program. That doesn't take a modern CPU very much time whatsoever. So we've had less than a second of actual running time on the CPU here. Most of the time we've just been waiting for the user, me, to type something in. If you have a process like a long running computationally intensive program, like let's say you get into CompSci 340 or 305 and you're doing a program that takes a long time to run, then you would see maybe that this is something other than 000, which would mean that that's how much time your, your process has actually been running on the CPU. And then lastly, we have the CMD, which stands for command. That's the actual command name of the process that we're running. What, what command is it actually doing? And so here you can see we have two commands. We have the bash command, which is when you log in over SSH, it launches a shell for you. And so this is the bash shell. We talked about bash to some degree last week. So this is our actual shell that we're running. And then the other command you can see in both of these cases was the PS command itself, because when we launched the PS program that started a process for PS and it appears here in the list of processes as well. And you can see this first one, of course, ended when the PS command terminated here. And so this other one was assigned a different PID. This first PS command was this one and the second PID, uh, PID indicates that this PS process here was different because it was a different command. Okay, so uh, that's not as really that interesting because if I just log in and do the PS command, those are the only two things really running. But if we want to see more things, we can give PS the dash capital A flag, which stands for all, and then it will list all of the processes that are being run on the system. And so if I hit enter here, we'll see a lot more things being printed out here. So now we have many, many more processes being printed. If you look here, a lot of them have TTY of question mark, and that means that there is no terminal sort of hooked up to that process. Most of these things are internal operating system processes that we don't need to worry about at all. But you can see that there's lots of processes actually running on this system, and you can see my bash process right here and my PS process right here are just one of dozens or maybe even hundreds of processes that are actually running on the system at one time. Let me clear the screen. A, another thing we can do is we can give PS the dash U flag followed by a username, and then that will print all of the processes run by a particular user. So if I do PS dash U I Finlay, it will give me, I'm not sure why it gives me these ones, but it, it gives me my SSHD process. So every time you log in over SSH, the SSH 
uh, server will launch sort of a process to handle your connection. So we'll all have one of these sort of running as well, in addition to the processes that I have launched myself, which in this case is just the bash and the PS. I'm going to open up another terminal window and log on to the CPSC server in it. And uh, I know you can't see what I'm doing right now, but here if I open up in Vim another, uh, or rather just open the Vim program in this other window, now if I do ps-ui finlay, you'll see more things here. So now I have uh, still on this terminal, the uh, pts-0 is my first SSH connection. I made the one that you're looking at. I have the bash program and the ps command. Then I have in this other window, pts-1, the separate uh, terminal window I'm running, I have bash and vim open. So there's nothing stopping you, I should say this by the way, from opening up multiple connections to the CPSC server at the same time. This is often really helpful. If I'm working on a program, I'll have maybe one window open with my code that I just leave up in vim, and then a second terminal window where I compile and run the program. There's no limit to how many connections you can make at the same time. Each of them will be given a different TTY, and if you just list PS by itself, you only get the ones that were started on this very same terminal connection. So PS just by itself only includes things from this actual window, whereas PS-U iFinlay will include all of my processes that I have open. Okay, so let's now talk about how to do some other things, like launching a process in the background. And for that, we'll look at the very a uh, questionably useful command, which is called sleep. Sleep is a command that takes in as its only argument however many seconds you want to sleep for. So if I do sleep one, this program does nothing but pause basically for one second. If I do sleep of five, then this program will do nothing except wait for five seconds before returning control back to my terminal. It is helpful sometimes in shell scripting if you want to have your program, your shell script sort of like pause for a second so the user can like view the terminal screen before carrying on or something like that, it can be helpful. But what we'll use it for is for playing around with uh, sending commands to the background and launching commands in the background. So whenever you launch a program by typing the name of a command or the path to it, if it's your own program, whenever you do that, it takes control of your terminal by default. So again, if I do sleep five, I can't do anything on my terminal until this program returns back. And then you can see it does, it sort of takes in my input and sort of does all these things after the fact. So if we want to do sleep of five, but be able to do something else while we're waiting, then we have to launch it a different way. We have to launch it in the background. And that is done just by putting the ampersand at the end of the command. What that does is it says run sleep of five, but do it in the background and let me do other things in my terminal at the same time. So now if I do that, you can see I have my terminal back right away and sleep of five is running in the background at the same time that I'm able to do other things. So if I try this again and I do sleep of five again in the background, then I do the PS command. Then you can see that now I have bash and sleep running and also the PS command. And you can sort of see as you go um, when, uh, when this is no longer the case, uh, it gives you this little message saying that sleep of five is done. It gave that to me uh, when I started the, the second one here, it told me that the first one was done. And then when I launched the PS command, the second time it tells me that sleep is done. And now if I launch PS again, we'll see that it is no longer listed here. So putting the ampersand at the end will cause it to run in the background and it's still running. It's just that you're able to use your terminal at the same time. So that's really helpful if you have a long running program. Like I said, if you get into the more advanced computer science classes, you might write programs that take more than a few seconds to run. In the parallel computing class that I sometimes teach, we'll run write programs that have to operate it on huge amounts of data and will take multiple minutes to run. And being able to run it in the background like this is really helpful because it doesn't take full control of your terminal. Likewise, we can use the wget command to download files from the internet and you might download a very large file and do it in the background so that it doesn't stop you from doing anything else at the same time. Something that'll be even more helpful, I expect, is 
canceling or killing a process that's currently running. If we do this with, let's say, sleep of 1,000, this will take 1,000 seconds to complete. And if we want to not wait 1,000 seconds for this to, to end, then we can do the control C. So if we type control C, it kills the process. And now if I do PS, we'll see that it isn't listed here any longer. So control C says, the process that's running currently in my terminal, just end it, just stop doing this and let me move on with my life. This is really helpful, like I said, if you have a program that you expect has an infinite loop. If you don't think your program should take very long and it's running for more than a couple of seconds, maybe you have an infinite loop in it and the only way to get out of that situation is to kill the program with control C like this. Something else we can do is to suspend a process. And that is done with control Z. So if I run this super long sleep for a thousand seconds again, and I do control Z, that stops and pauses the process and brings me back to the terminal. But if we look, we can see that it is still actually running. It's just sort of being paused or suspended at this time. And it will allow me to do other things, maybe check something, and then I can go back to it again with the FG command. FG stands for foreground, it sort of means like run this thing again in the foreground. And then I can pause it again if I want with control Z. So control Z and FG sort of work as like the pause and unpause controls for the terminal here. I can unpause it and go back into it with, with FG and I can pause it again with control Z. I can pause as many things as I want. So I can sleep uh, for 1001, pause that sleep for 1002 and pause that again. And then with the PS command, we should see that I'm running multiple sleep commands now, all of which have been suspended with control Z. Now, if we do this jobs command, it will sort of show all of the things that you have just suspended. So it shows me that I have these three suspended here. And now if I type the FG command, by default, it just goes back to the most recently suspended one. But if I want to, I can suspend it again. And then I can go back to whichever one I want by doing the percent sign. So I can say, go back to sleep of 1,000 by bringing number one from this list into the foreground. So uh, oftentimes, I'll find that you won't really suspend more than one thing at a time. And so usually just using Control Z to suspend and then FG to resume is sufficient. But if you ever, for whatever reason, have multiple things suspended, it will handle that as well. You can suspend as many things as you want and then list what they are with jobs and then go back to them with FG followed by which number you want with a percent sign. So I can pause this one and then go back into number two, which should be sleep of a thousand and one. And so you can sort of switch between any of the processes that you have suspended at any time. I sometimes do this also with Vim. So let's say I'm working on a file. Let me see. I think I have something in here, uh, this program.py. I'll open this with Vim. If I am writing this file and then I want to check something real quick, I can suspend it with control Z and then check like a man page, for instance, pull up the man page to ls, quit out, and then go back into Vim like that. So rather than save and quit Vim and then open up the file again, you can use control Z to suspend it and then FG to pop back into it, um, which is sort of a helpful thing you can do as well. Let me put out of this. So let me see if any of these jobs are still running. Yeah, a thousand seconds is a long time. So these are all still running. Uh, or actually, they're, they're suspended, so they definitely will be, will be running. The other thing that you can do rather than FG to get back into these is you can also do BG to run them again. And when you do that, it starts it running. But if you look, it adds the, uh, pers the ampersand rather onto the end of it. And so what that means is that now it's running all of these in the background. So you can use FG to pop back into the process that you started and have it take over your terminal like you run it normally or you can use bg to pop back into the process and run it except now it'll be running in the background as if you had started it with this ampersand here so that is a helpful thing that we can do let me see uh, do i have all these things running 
So now these are all running, but they're not paused like they were before. Now they're actually in the process of running, and so they should be actually counting against those 1,000 seconds. This is helpful if you have a program that you start running, uh, and then you realize, like, oh, dang, this is going to take a long time. I should have run this in the background. So let's start another one, like sleep of 400. And we realize, like, ah, dang, I don't want to wait 400 seconds. I want this to run in the background. You can suspend it and then run the BG command. And now it is running in the background. So if you forget to put this ampersand on here, just suspend it and then do the BG command to start it running again in the background um, is a way to do that. All right, so now I have all these things running. Uh, oops, I have these multiple sleep commands running. What if I want to kill them like I would with Control C, but they're not actually currently running in the foreground of my terminal? So again, remember, I can kill something with Control C like this, but I can't do this for these other commands. Just doing Control C here does nothing because these are not running in the foreground of the terminal, like this one was, they're running in the background. They're running as one of my processes. Well, I can do that by sending them signals. And for that, we're going to need this process ID. So I wish the command to send a signal was called like send or signal or something like that. Uh, but the command for sending signals is called kill, which I have two kind of issues with this. One, it feels like sort of needlessly violent language. Uh, and the other reason is that uh, kill is called kill because one of the signals we can send to a process is the kill signal, which tells it to, to stop, <laughs> to, to, to end. But uh, by default, kill doesn't even send the kill signal. So if I say kill and then I type 17, 0015, that should have ended this process. Now, uh, oops, shoot, I tried, to, I tried to kill my bash process, which luckily ignores this signal. Uh, I did the wrong one, my bad. Uh, 170589 is the sleep one I wanted to, to end. So if I send this, if I, if I do this command kill 170589, it sends a signal to this sleep command, and now this one shouldn't be, any, be here any longer. And, and you can see that it's not. One of them actually finished. Um, I can kill the other one, 170609 and 610, and then 170722 and 745. That should be all of them. Uh, oops. Yeah, that looks like all of them. This one, it looks like maybe ended before I could send the signal for it. So it said there was no such process running at that time. It ended sort of, happened to end sort of naturally. Uh, the other ones, we looks like we did kill them. Let me do another one just to make sure. Uh, super long time, we're sleeping. We can see it tells us, first of all, when you launch something with ampersand, it gives you the process ID so that if you need to refer to it back, you can. But we can always find it with the PS command. Now we can see this uh, process ID 170766. Again, I can kill this with 170766. And then that ends the process. And if I do PS, we should see that it isn't there. And when you do PS, it does, it does tell you that this one had been terminated. Uh, so. Um, that, that is what happened here. We, we really were killing these things. They didn't just happen to naturally end at the same time, except for this one, uh, which I guess was just very good timing. But uh, this, is how, this is how we can end a command without it sort of running in the foreground. We find the process ID for the process we want to kill, and then we send the signal to it with the kill command. Now, confusingly, kill doesn't actually send the kill signal. The Unix system has multiple different signals that we can send. We can send a signal to kill. Uh, we can send a signal to terminate, which is actually what we did. There's uh, other signals we might touch on. So there's two main signals to end a process. One is the terminate signal, which is actually what gets sent by default. And terminate is like a, a more polite way of ending a process. The terminate command, uh, the terminate signal rather, is like, hey, please 
and uh, I don't want you to be here anymore. Can you please just wrap up what you're doing and, and, and stop? And most processes respond well to that. Um, most processes will end themselves at that point and not carry on any longer. Some processes, though, uh, re require a stronger hand. This doesn't happen very often. Um, one program that does per, uh, not allow itself to be killed with SIGTERM is this bash process, which we already saw because I accidentally tried to kill it. Uh, 170015 doesn't actually, oops, 170015 doesn't actually kill the bash process. It ignores the sig term signal. If you come into this, uh, come across this, <laughs> some processes will do this, then you can kill it with another signal, which is the dash kill signal, which can be sent like this. I don't really wanna do it um, to bash because that will prevent us from, from, uh, from doing this. Um, so if I uh, launch another one like this, and then I should have run in the background, so I'll do that. Then I can list this process to find its process ID, which is 171087, and I can kill it with cache uh, kill dash K I L L 171087. And then this is sort of like a less polite way of killing the process. It's like you are unable to prevent this, you're unable to do anything to stop it, we're just going to remove this process from the operating system. The uh, reason that these both things exist is that the polite one, which is done with um, the default signal, which is term like this, uh, sig term. The reason for having the more polite one is because it gives the process a chance to sort of clean up anything that it needs to. For instance, if you send a sig term to Vim, it will make sure to save in a temporary file any work before before quitting. So sig term is like a suggestion, like, hey, save what you're doing and stop. Uh, some processes every now and then it won't work on because they are completely unresponsive and they aren't even able to receive the sig term process in order to sort of save what they're doing. And so in those cases, you can use this sig kill command, which again is done like this with passing dash k i l l to the kill command. So it's kind of weird because again, kill is for sending any kind of signal, uh, including the kill signal, but the kill signal isn't even the default term is, which stands for terminate. So we can actually send other signals two processes as well. We can send USR1. This is uh, oftentimes not really that useful, but um, there's, there's other, like I said, other ones that we can send as well. We can send USR1 to a process, and, and there is no process because I ended this. Uh, this is just used for whatever the programmer intended. So. If you're writing a program, you can capture these signals and respond to them in different ways. So there's two, USR1 and USR2, that are reserved for like whatever the program wants to interpret them as. And so there's some programs that capture these. So one is this program DD, which is used for like transferring one hard disk to another. Uh, I unfortunately don't have a great way of uh, demonstrating this command for you because I don't, I don't want, to, uh, I don't want to sort of overwrite any of the hard disks that are attached to the CPSC server. Uh, I use it on like my own local computer for doing like uh, device transfers, like burning an ISO file to a CD or to a thumb drive or something like that. But this command captures the USR1 signal and whenever it receives it, it prints sort of its status, what percentage of the way you are done and stuff like that. So for the third assignment for this class, in order to give you practice with sending signals, I've asked you to send a signal to a program I wrote and that interprets it in a specific way related to the assignment. And so this is how you can do that. You can send that signal to a program, kill-usr1, and then send the name of the signal to it or rather send the process ID which you want to send it to. That same program in assignment three also ignores the sig term signal. So if you want to end it, you'll have to do dash kill like this to actually get it to end. All right, so one last thing to talk about related to processes, which is the htop command. htop is a command that is 
uh, interactive like Vim is, it, when you run it, you're greeted to a completely different looking window than what you normally are. Here we have sort of a task manager type program, like when you type control alt delete on Windows, we're given sort of this dynamic view of the processes that are being run on this system. And it gives you a lot of information, how much memory is being used, how much swap space is being used. And it also sort of gives you these columns, just like PS does, except they're sort of dynamically being updated. It uh, actually takes mouse input. So if you click on these rows, it actually does different things. So like we can sort by CPU usage or memory usage and sort of see the different things that are running on this. We can sort by all of these different columns. I can sort by user and sort of see the ones that I have running myself. You can also um, uh, send signals to them by doing the F9 command. Let me hop out of here first and uh, start a sleep command um, in the background. And then we'll be able to kill that here. So I can scroll down with the arrow keys um, or sort of click to get to the sleep command. And then I can kill it with F9. And if you look, when, when you type F9 on it, it gives you a list of signals that you can send. And so you can see there are quite a lot of signals that can be sent. The SIG term, like I said, is the default one, and it's the default in HTOP2, which is why it's selected here. SIG kill is number nine, and you can see SIG user one is here, and SIG user two is here. So we have a bunch of different signals that we can send to the process, most of which you don't really need to worry about. But if I want to send SIG term, I can click on 15 and then click Enter, and now it should be um, killed. You can get out of this program with either Q for quit, or if you see down here in the menu, you could do F10 to quit as well. So now this uh, sleep command will no longer be here because we killed it from within HTOP. So you can either sort of send the signals by first finding them in PS and finding their process ID, then using the kill command, or you can do it in HTOP, which is sort of a more dynamical way of doing it like this. There is one other thing I forgot to, to talk about, which is there's another command very much like kill, but it's called kill all. And in this one, we kill not by, uh, I hate saying they were killed so much, but we kill not by the process ID, but rather by the name of the program it's running. So if I have multiple sleep commands like I did before, uh, a thousand in the background, and a thousand and one in the background, a thousand and two, a thousand and three, if I'm using the kill command, I can find their process ID and sort of kill them one by one, like kill 171177, like this. Or I can do the kill all command. And with kill all, you give it the name of the program that it's running, and it kills, like the name of the command would indicate, all of the processes that are running that command. So rather than giving them all, uh, sort of the process ID one by one to the kill command, we can use the kill all command to sort of kill them in one fell swoop. This also works with uh, multiple different types of signals as well. So we can do dash K-I-L-L -L like this to send the sig kill signal instead. And now there aren't any sleep processes, so it won't work. But had there been, we could do that as well. And then it says killed instead of terminated. All of the processes have numbers associated with them. And so we can, with the kill or the kill all command, we can do this with either the number or with the name of the signal. So if I have sleep 1,000 in the background like this, I can send it the default signal of term, 71218, like this. Or I can give the number of the signal, which is 15. And so that will terminate it as well. Likewise, with kill, I can either type K-I-L-L -L like this to cause this program to end, or I can uh, start a new one. I can give the number of the kill signal, which is number 9. And that will kill it as well with the sig kill signal. So term is number 15, which is the default. The stronger, uh, not giving you any choice in the matter option is the kill signal, which is number nine. And uh, 
people often will do kill dash nine just sort of as like, okay, I really want this program to end. I really want to end this process way of doing that. So if you see dash nine, know that that's the same thing as kill here. You can either give sort of the name of the signal or rather its number. All right, so today we've talked about a bit of things related to managing processes. We've talked about listing what processes are here, sort of seeing the different processes that either are run from your terminal or run from your user in any terminal or run from the entire system. We've also looked at different ways of starting processes. We can start a process in the background. We've also looked at how to either pause or stop a process that we have started in our terminal. We've looked at how to resume a process which has been paused and also how to take a process which has been paused and start running it in the background. Then we looked at the signal system, how we can send signals to different processes and the HTOP command that we can use to sort of dynamically see processes and uh, go through and send them signals should we need to. So that's all for this week. Next week in week nine, we're going to be talking about searching in files and searching files either by their contents or by like their, their file name and stuff, which is also a really helpful thing that we can do in the Unix environment. So I'll see you next week for that. Thanks, bye.